Hi, folks. Good afternoon. Okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, welcome to join our Sunday service. Okay, yes. Yeah, so welcome to our newcomer. It's the first top priority. Okay, how about the left hand, my left hand side? Okay. Okay, it seems that it's low. A new, the first time comma. Okay. If you find a new comma, okay, just give me a look. Okay, how about my right hand side? Okay, no. Okay. Mm. No. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now we are going to read our monthly scripture three times. Okay. The first, the second times we are going to read in English, and the um, last time, we the third time we are read in Pinyin. Okay. Let's. Let's read all together. Okay, one, two, three. Making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 16 to 17. Making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 16 to 17. Okay, now we are going to read in Pinyin. Okay. 要爱惜光阴,因为现今的世代邪恶,不要做无头人,要明白主的旨意如何,以分所书五章十六到十七节。Now I'm going to invite JJ to come to make some announcement. Okay, thank you. Hello everyone, here are your announcements for the 17th of November. The first item, thank God for his guidance, enabling our church to hold the Praying for Canada's Return to God prayer meeting yesterday. Let us pray for our nation, asking God for mercy, protection, and guidance to lead the country back to the Christian faith. We are grateful for the simple solemn, solemn Remembrance Day observance during last Sunday's worship service. May God grant us more love and wisdom to care for and show his love to this nation. Please pray for the rehearsals of our Christmas play. May God protect the participating brothers and sisters and may this play glorify his name during the Christmas season. I believe Tinian or Winston? <laughs> Yes, next Saturday, 4.45. For stewards, our meeting will be held today after Sunday school in the usual room. Now it's time for Bible verse memorization. This, this week's challenge is from Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, uh, let our... Let our needs be known to God. Okay. As well as New City Catechism number 39, with what attitude should we pray? With love, uh, perseverance, and, and gratefulness, in humble submission to the will of God, knowing that for the sake of Christ, he, he always hears our prayers. <laughs> okay, Leslie? Mr. Bong. <laughs> Mr. Bong, yes.
Let me, Winston. Any more takers? Oh, Alina, right? Yes. Are there any more takers? Tinlock. Well done. Is there anyone else? Tinyan. Okay, is there anyone else? Okay, let us read next week's challenge together. Next week's challenge is from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 19. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. As well as question 40 of the New City Catechism, what should we pray? The whole word of God directs and inspires us in what we should pray, including the prayer Jesus himself taught us. All right, thank you, everyone. As it is the third week of the month, we have supplications today. Uh, we have... 
13 items today. So let us go through them together. Our first one, please pray that God continues to guide and lead our congregation and for him to provide a suitable pastor for us. Number two, please pray for the war between Ukraine and Russia as well as the conflicts in the Middle East. May our Lord bring peace, justice, and righteousness to these conflicts. Number three, we thank God for his protection and guidance yesterday for our prayer meeting where almost 300 people attended this prayer meeting. And may God continue to guide our national leaders to lead and govern the country according to his will. Number four, this is a prayer item for our next prayer meeting on December 14th. Let us earnestly intercede for and watch over our brothers and sisters in house churches in China who are facing government persecution. May God guide this prayer meeting to proceed smoothly. Number five, thank the Lord that Brother Schuyler and Charlie attended the CCEF conference in early October, and they shared their insights and reflections in our Gabriel Fellowship. May God inspire more of our young people to participate in the spiritual feast next year. Number six, may God lead and guide the rehearsals for the, for the gospel drama of our Christmas celebration and ensure smooth communication with the church. May all glory be to the Lord. Number seven, may God guide our university graduates in finding jobs or co-op opportunities that align with his will so they may glorify his name in the workplaces. Number eight, may God fill us with a desire for his word. Let us participate in the Sunday Bible verse memorization activity and also read God's word daily, making it a necessity in our lives. Number nine, over the past six months, the attendance of Gabriel Fellowship and Sunday service have been declining. So may God guard our hearts amidst our busy lives more than anything else that we may love God, love his word, love the church, and love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Number 10, praise the Lord. Our Sunday school attendance has been stable over the past few months. May God encourage more people to participate, equipping us better through his word. Number 11, pray for the healing and recovery for these people. Uh, first, Samuel's mother and her ongoing health struggles. Samuel is not here. Second, for Solomon's wrist pain and eczema. Solomon here. Okay, Eddie's dad, who is still recovering from his illness. Oh, Eddie, do you have any updates? He's doing well. Praise the Lord. Finally, Charlie's hand to recover from a work-related injury. It's back at work. <laughs> Thank God for the full recovery. Number 12, happy birthday to these people, Helen, Colin, Eddie, Samuel's son, Winston, and Mrs. Pong. May our Lord shine upon them and lead them while they turn a new page in their lives. Praise him. Number 13, finally pray to pray for ourselves, may our Lord give us pure hearts and clean hands to free us from our temptations and bondages. May he guide us to manage our time and have healthy spiritual appetites. May he teach us to trust him faithfully and diligently, allowing our lives to glorify his name. Let us take this time to pray in groups of three to four, and then we'll come back for a prayer.
Okay, let's come back together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege for us in this country to have freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, so that we can we can assemble here today and we can worship you. Thank you for your providence, and we just ask that you would hear our prayers today and you would answer our prayers. We pray for our youth pastor seeking process. We ask that while you guide us, we ask that you would help us find a suitable pastor for us. Also, I pray for those who are less fortunate than us in the world who are uh, under persecution right now or in war in war torn countries. We just pray for your righteousness and for your peace for them. And um, just ask that you would give us the heart to, to care for these people and for us to pray for them. And we just ask that you would move our hearts so that we would be able to join our prayer meeting in December. And we just ask that you would also move our hearts to encourage those who have been absent from our congregation for long periods of time, for them to come back and for more people to to join in uh, these these duties that we have as Christians. And we just pray for ourselves that you would uh, keep us from temptation. You would de deliver us from our chains and from our bondages. And you would help us lead a life that is, that is for your glory and that is blessed by you. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now is the time for worship. Everyone, please stand for the reading of the Word of God. Today's call to worship is from Psalm 101, uh, verses 1 to 8, and I invite everyone to read with me. Psalm chapter 101, verses 1 to 8. I will sing of steadfast love and injustice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. I hate the work of those who fall away and shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. I will look with favor on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Morning by morning, I will destroy all the wicked in the land, cutting off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here for us to worship you, and thank you for all the blessings that you've given us this this week and in our lives. We just ask that you would help us turn those blessings into worship today, and you would find our worship today a pleasing aroma, and that you would um, that you would forgive us for our, for our sins and our shortcomings this week, and have our worship be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Let us pray as our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Let us sing our first song, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When I survey the wondrous cross on which 
which the Prince of Glory died. My riches gain I count but loss, and poor contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? O'er thorns composed so rich a crown were the Far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. For a second song, let us sing, The Lord is My Salvation. The grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on this solid ground the Lord is my salvation I will not fear when darkness falls his strength will help me scale these walls. I see the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God? Strong to save, faithful in love. My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. My hope is hidden in the Lord. He flowers each promise of His word. When winter fades, I know spring will come. The Lord is my salvation. In times of waiting, times of need, when I know loss, when I am weak, I know His grace will renew these days. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save, faithful in love? My dad is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. 
And when I reach my final day, He will not leave me in the grave, but I will rise, He will call me home. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save, faithful in love? My debt is paid and the victory won. You may be seated. Now is the time for the prayer of confession. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Let us take this time to confess our sins before the Lord and ask for his forgiveness. Dear Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that we have failed to perfectly keep your law this week and we have fallen short of your glory. Uh, as we approach the throne of grace, remind us that it is through the work of our Lord Jesus on the cross that our sins are forgiven. We just thank you for this for the sacrifice and for the greatest act of love this world has ever seen. We ask for your grace and for your mercy as we go as we go through this pilgrimage of Christian life. We ask that you would sanctify us as we draw near to glory. We just ask that you would create this gratefulness in our heart and that we would show your love to our neighbors and for those who have yet to believe and we just ask that you would help us become the salt and the light of this world. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen. amen. Please stand. Christians, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today's sermon comes from Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. Our speaker is Brother Schuyler, and the title of his message is, Do Not Submit to Apparent Wisdom. Please remain standing as I read today's verse. Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. Those who have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. These are the words of the Lord. Please be seated invites Brother Schuyler to the pulpit. Brothers and sisters, shalom. It's uh, such, a, such a great 
opportunity and the joy to be with you once a month. Um, some of you have been uh, in our church yesterday for the prayer meeting. Uh, you may receive the powerful message from pastors, and some of you remember that uh, Pastor Moore talked about something about purpose of life and uh, how that became a big problem uh, in our world now. And um, after uh, the prayer meeting yesterday, and I, I was involved in a little conversation with other brothers and sisters, and then we were there, and we talked about something really big. Uh, someone brought about a question saying, hey, I'll ask a question. Uh, you know, as a proud teacher, I always love to answer questions. So I said, what's the question? And he, uh, he or she said, um, I feel my life, my Christian life, is always a cycle. I always repeat the same error on and on, over and over and over again. That's like I've never learned from it. Then he, he or she asked a deep question saying that, is that true that there's no way to learn from history? Is that true that the only thing some people say, Hegel or someone say, the only thing we learn from history is that we cannot learn from history. Is that true? That's very sad. But it's a very deep question about wisdom, how to see history or how to see the world as a whole. Without digging into that question, we're going to today get into this topic of wisdom and to talk about three things. Number one, we're going to talk about how the wisest people in the ancient time, the Greeks, how do they understand wisdom. And then we're going to move on to the Hebrew people who received the wisdom from their old times of scripture called the Hebrew Bible. How do they understood wisdom? And then lastly, we're going to compare the so-called the wisest people in the world to see really deeply of the truth of this world and how they desperately came to a failure but how the gospel shined the only light onto these impossible question of wisdom. Before we move on, let me remind us a little bit of Paul's teaching in the entire chapter 2 of Colossians. Remember, Paul is teaching a group of Christians who just became Christians from both the background of the Hebrew and the Greek, both the religious and the pagan. So he had to manage their growth in Christianity on both ways. Then he started from the very beginning saying that in verse 6 and 7 that our entire Christian life is in one phrase which is called in Christ. That means our Savior Jesus Christ has provided everything we need in order to live out this heavenly life called a Christian life. And it's not from us, but it's from heaven. And then his entire teaching would be based on this phrase, in Christ. And all of a sudden afterwards, he warned us of the dangers of a false philosophy. This is very important. Because philosophical questions is always deeply in our heart and mind, so that whenever we talk about it, I heard it, uh, several, some time before uh, brothers and sisters would talk about the politics, AI, career, stuff, a whole bunch of things. Underneath these kind of questions is the deep philosophical questions of life. And that is based on our understanding of the whole world. In other words, that is worldview problem. It is a philosophical problem. And based on this, the wisest teacher among the apostles, Paul, said we must understand all wisdom from the world are all false because they are based on not Christ, but either human tradition or the things about the world. Human tradition, that means things we talked about last time, is basically can be summarized called humanism, is that our understanding of the world is based on our experience in the world. Even the highest experience in the world is a religious experience. It's like those rituals. People gather together, try to see something beyond by what they received in these religious gatherings. Those are religious wisdom or human experience. Even some of our extremely extraordinary called supernatural experiences. But the fundamental of it is humanism. Is that wisdom comes from human experience. 
And the next is what Paul would teach us today, which can be called scientism. I don't want to call it materialism because there's a problem of it. We're going to go over it. But we call that a scientism, which is saying that this whole world is understood based on the things in the world other than we human beings. As long as we master how the world works, then our life will be great. That would be something we're going to dig into it. So our topic about wisdom would be focusing on these scientism. Okay, let's move on to the first part, the ancient wisdom. How about we first read together verse 20? Three, two, one, please. Okay, thanks be the word of the Lord. So, sorry, uh, my, my speed is a little bit up, to be like a 1.5, like I, I, I listen to YouTube, like some of you, but uh, it's because there are so many material to be covered today, so I, I hope I, I do not go over, over time. Let's go. So, first of all, elemental spirits of the world, okay, these phrase must be, we talk about it. At first the time I, I heard about it, I thought, oh, there's some degree of spirits, like elemental spirits or secondary spirits, or like universal, university spirits or something like that. No, that's, that's not what it is. Uh, if we look at the original language, uh, this phrase could be translated in a pretty flexible range. It could be something like this, but I think the most, uh, most helpful translation is that a world view of with elements and the spirit, okay? A worldview of elements and the spirits. So what does it mean? The old ancient uh, Greek philosophers, they understood the whole world in such a way. They said, as long as anything we can see in the world, those things are composed of some elements. Uh, some of them said there's only one element, like uh, someone called... Um, Thales or Thales, I don't know how to pronounce that word. Uh, Thales believe that there's only one element, which is water, and everything is made up of water. It's hard to believe, but he believed it, and he's called the first scientist, and he discovered lot of, lots of things. Anyway, so that's one example. And there are some, like Aristotle, and he believed that there were four elements in the world. There are earth, wind, fire, and water, and these four com combined in some way, and everything come into place. So these are called elements. But obviously, elements cannot come together just by our own. So there must be some way that they could come together. That's what? That's what they call the spirits. Because it's invisible. We cannot, and we cannot see it, but it has to be there. So they just call them spirits. Okay? So for by the spirits, they don't mean angels. They mean just something we cannot understand. So things put together, and uh, the table just became table, and rock became rock, and mountain became mountain, and sea became sea, and fish became a fish. Those are spirits, okay? But to the highest point, the spirits is the man's spirit, the, man, uh, the spirit of the humanity. That is the human soul. And the highest, material, highest elements will compose the human body. Therefore, the human became a micro... Uh, cosmic of the whole world. Human soul and human body became the highest form of spirit and elements. So that's their worldview. And the rule is spirits determine elements. How that, uh, how that rock became a rock is not because those elements are powerful, but because those spirits, they had the power to combine those elements into the rock, so the rock became a rock. Therefore, spirits has a higher hierarchy over the elements. So same thing happened is in our human body. Soul is over body. Therefore, thinking determines lagging. How my brain works determines how my arms works. Therefore, human knowledge, human thinking would be higher than human body. Therefore, those thinkers, those philosophers, they became the highest of human beings because they know better than other people. So human soul determine human body. We can see these philosophies are also prevailing nowadays. Why does LGBTQ is very powerful? Because they say, I think I am something. Then I determine my body to be something. You see, it's still the same thing. It's spirit determines the elements, and the soul determines the body. It's the same philosophy. But 
There's one called Plato. He made something really greater. He says, um, it is possible that uh, when we think in our mind and come up with our soul, and as somehow we can even obtain the knowledge of something beyond, which is not just a human soul, but is the soul of the something higher. So human mind became the transaction station between the divine and the human. Between, it is an intersection station between the supernatural and the natural. That is the human mind. So from Plato on, human mind became even something like a god. Okay, you can see that is still running nowadays. But no matter what, the ancient Greeks, the philosophers, they believed that the spirit determines the elements and the soul determine the body. That is what Paul is saying that elemental spirits of the world. And we see the devastating consequence of it even happening in our world now. How can human beings be comparable with the Almighty God? How can human mind comprehend the almighty ways of God, his way is higher than our way. His will is higher than our will. How many people right now, even in our experience, we're confusing that whether my will is God's will, whether I'm falling, uh, I'm running on the right track as God wills me to do. Do I have we question ourselves? Am I satisfying in my limited knowledge of, of, of like a human beings and a sinful human being that I'm not able to comprehend the high things like, um, uh, uh, like Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the glory of God. And the, for us, we are human beings. God gave us law so that we may obey him, we and our offsprings. That is the paradigm of being human beings and different from the divine. This is the worldview of the ancient Greeks. Let's move on to the another really wise people. That is the ancient Hebrews. They were different from the ancient Greeks because they were given the word of God. And Moses wrote for them at the beginning of their scripture saying that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this one phrase could give the whole structure of the Hebrew wisdom saying that this almighty God who is uncreated and is always there and he alone is from everlasting to everlasting. He determines the whole structure and design and the sustaination, how to sustain that world all belong to this one God. This worldview belong to the Hebrews. However, does it mean that the Hebrews would continue on the right path and follow this right wisdom? No. According to Paul, they didn't. That's why when Paul wrote these verses, after verse 20, he continued wrote verse 21. Let's read verse 21 for, uh, together. Three, two, one, please. Thank you. Three words, but we see it reminds us that Paul here is talking about he has mentioned before. It is something related to the religious ritual observations. That was what he mentioned in those feasts, in those Sabbaths, that the Hebrews that they learned from the Hebrew um, Bible, that there were lots of uh, festivals and the Sabbaths and observations. Uh, uh, observations that they must keep so that their worship in the temple may be acceptable to God. Why Paul mentioned these do not, do not, do not again? Because Paul is speaking to those Hebrew background Christians saying that do not think that you received the Old Testament the Bible and you truly got the wisdom that you can really live this life on the world in the true wisdom. Do not think in that way, right? Because those Hebrew background Christians, they still have a strong tendency to focus on those particular observations and submit themselves to observe them all the day long. They even cannot help but trust that somehow they have to do those things. Let me give you an illustration. Have you ever those experienced? Maybe you have not. Maybe some of you have 
uh, you have that. Uh, once upon a time, uh, during COVID, uh, we know at that moment, the Holy Communion was uh, given in a uh, finished product, and you got your, uh, that, that uh, bread on the top, and you, you have the, uh, the juice on the bottom. is a complete whole. So what happened was that, what, uh, you know, at that, uh, that moment, we have to go to the church and uh, receive the, that uh, cup and bread and take it home and, and have it. Uh, some of you have this experience. So what happened to me was that at that moment, uh, somehow, I cannot remember, but I went to the church and I received that cup and bread and I took it home and somehow I forgot. Uh, I, I did. And then I, uh, I find, oh, all of a sudden, I, I, I did not have that, uh, uh, my communion. And what do I do? What do I do? Then I went to the church again and I got another one. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, I, oh, of course, that Sunday was okay, and I, I took the communion, and that went, went well. But all of a sudden, afterwards, on the, uh, um, uh, on, on the trunk of my, of my car, I opened it up, and there are lots of garbages. And uh, at the very end of it, I find a, a little bag, a plastic bag, with a communion uh, being pressed, uh, distorted in it. And I feel a very strong horror in my heart. It, it is like something very sacred uh, was, uh, was somehow damaged by me. And they're, they're like something really bad would happen to me. So what happened was that I took that little bag and took it back. And I put it on my shelf. And I cannot do anything with it. I cannot throw it away. I cannot do anything with it. So I'm not sure you have this experience or not. But some people may have feeling that. Uh, there is something really secret. Um, we cannot touch it. We, we cannot do anything with it. It, it, is, it is very, very special. So Paul is tacking something like this. Look, Paul is asking, think again. Why we are so, um, we are so much focused on these materials? Okay, listen, I'm not going to the liberal side saying whatever, you, you can do whatever. No, no, no. I'm not saying that. We're conservatives, not politically. What I mean is that this is a fact. This is something really beyond our understanding, that when we are facing something in the world materially, and we feel this something more than material, actually, this is good. That's why Christian value always emphasizes the sanctity of life. That means that when the baby is already in the womb of the mother. Uh, for example, Joy right now is almost a three month. Uh, we pray for that baby. I pray for his or her conversion. I pray for his or her whole life following the Lord. Uh, that may seem ridiculous, but according to the Bible, God's election starts from um, what time? I don't know, but I should pray for it. Um, that's something secret. It's the sanctity of life. That's why Abortion is wrong. It's not determined by political views, but it's because of that God's creation there, we should have a sense of sanctity that destroying that kind of life is a horror. That should exist in human heart. But that, uh, that uh, absence of the horror of this kind of fear is the problem of humanity now. It cannot be solved by politics. It probably can help. But the politics should help the church to establish the truth to as many people as possible so that God wills that all may repent and know the will of God and know the truth. And that is the only way unto salvation. Anyway, come back to this topic of the worldview. Thanks, Bill. I, I got 20-ish minutes. So let's move on. We see Paul is saying that some of the things are there in the world. We can touch it, we can see it, we can even taste it, but it doesn't mean that those are things have perpetual sanctity, perpetual sacred power or somehow higher meaning in it. It doesn't mean it's always like that. But the Hebrew people, they cannot help, but they received this instruction from heaven from Moses at that moment of the Old Testament period, and they find the tabernacle and those instruments and those materials in the temple and in the tabernacle, they were secret. 
they should be only handled by the Levites and by particular um, uh, personnel, but not by everybody. God gave the sanctity, the secretness of those things at that period of time. However, the Hebrew people, they thought the sanctity of those things are in the things themselves. Therefore, the sanctity continued all the way through the history, and they always remain secret. That became a problem because deep down in their understanding of the world, they still thought things in the world that we can see, we can touch, we can taste, they were there operated by something driving them out, like the ancient spirits understand them as uh, spirits, or like modern scientists understood them as scientific laws or uh, social laws or whatever laws. They just change the name. They don't like the idea of a personal spirits which organize the things together. They just change the personal uh, spirits into a impersonal laws. But this thing is the same. It's to explain why things are there and the meaning of them. So they call them laws. That's it. It's the same philosophy. Elements, spirits put together, that's it. That's the worldview of them. And the Hebrew people, they received the, the instruction from Moses, but it didn't mean that their life was changed by God's word. But they were some people. Their life were changed because once they sacrificed the lamb and the oxen, they find the blood was shed and they realized that something is more than that. The sanctity of those blood represents God's forgiveness in the blood. They realize that something higher than those animals, those instruments themselves. So they went beyond, but not everybody understood the message of salvation of God in those things. So Paul, again here, reminds us that even we received a certain religious traditions and we do some things in the church and something looks very secret, it doesn't mean that we truly received the salvation because those things in themselves could be explained by scientific terms. And we know how powerful it is. Right now, people don't like scientific laws. They like, they like AI or chat GBD to explain everything. Same thing. We just don't know how it works, so ask sign G, uh, chat GPT. Is the same result, is that things are there, I don't know how it works, somebody knows, chat GPT knows, okay? Same thing, elements and spirits. And the danger is the same, is that these are not all the things there, at least Hebrews news, that the world was created by God and not there on their own. So they are a little bit better then the understanding of things and something, scientific laws, drive the things out. But even just know that God created the things, everything in the world, doesn't mean that we have a true relationship with this God. We see how the name of Jesus right now has been um, used in what kind of ways. They use Jesus as, I don't know, whatever. They call the name of God, whatever. Everyone can say he or she is a Christian and do things absolutely contrary to the Bible. That confused our Christian life. The name God, G-O-D, only refers to the triune God, God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in the Bible. And the Bible is the book of the triune God. There's no anything other than this. Christians, we must be firm on this. So go back to Paul's teaching. Paul here is saying that even the Hebrews, they receive the instruction of God, but that they are in danger of falling into the same trap, which is thinking the things in the world are still driven by the spirits somehow in it, and that's it. But let's see the Lord, what the Lord Jesus has been debating with the Pharisees concerning this matter and how the Lord Jesus has uh, talked to them. So Matthew 12, 1 to 2 says, At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry. 
And they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, "Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath." Now, this is what happened to the religious Jews when they saw that Jesus was leading his disciples to get food from the field, which looks like forbidden in the Moses law. They called that they received. Because they thought, go to the temple, worship in the form of a religion. That is the most sacred thing to do in their understanding. But Jesus, as the Son of God, God incarnate, who had, who is really the Lord of the Sabbath, they don't care. Then they made a huge mistake to thought the small matter is big, and the, the huge matter is small. That's a tragedy. So therefore, we have to learn from this lesson that the very reason why we Christians knew this world differently is not because we have a wisdom in our mind that we are smarter than other people. No, it's because the revelation of the Bible. God says in history, two thousand years ago, He made a change. He made a change for this world. By His authority, by His power, by His sending His Son to this world to fulfill the law and open up that new covenant by His blood, so that history is no longer the same. Because God's action in history, Hegel is wrong. Hegel is saying that history doesn't have actually before and after is always the same in the proverbial way. It's wrong because God made a change in history. The Old Testament observances they passed not because they are they didn't have value anymore. Yes, they don't have the value they used to have to predict the coming of the Lord Jesus. But when the Lord Jesus came, who fulfilled the law, those passed away, and these passed away, people could not understand in our mind. Communism always says that the world is just spinning around and around. Pastor Hong said this, and there's always a reputation because they didn't really know the true wisdom. It's all apparent wisdom. It looks like true, but it's not true because God made a change two thousand years ago to divide the B.C. and the A.D. That makes the history totally different. Christians, we received this not with our mind. But from God's revelation and the secret work of the Holy Spirit, change our heart and mind that we find we want to believe it. It's not our work; it's the grace of God from His election. The Lord Jesus mentioned that the heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. The Lord Jesus is saying clearly that there are something. That is perpetually valid. That will not be interrupted by history, which has eternal validation. That is not the material nor the spirit, but the word of God. That goes through history, always true. But heaven and earth will pass away. Those won't last forever. This is absolutely contrary. To our normal natural thinking, that everything will be the same all the way through in our life, no, it is the other way around by the authority of God. May God help us to really submit to His understanding, knowing the value of the true eternal thing, the Word of God, and seeing this world as something passing away. But is that easy? It's not easy. At all, wise man in the world. Oh, sorry. We should read the scripture first. Sorry. Let's read the last two verses together first. Okay. Last two verses, verse twenty-two and verse twenty-three. Three, two, one. Please. Thanks be the word of the Lord. We see again, Paul is taking out a、um, he a poke 
the human teaching and human tradition. We have seen the Pharisees, they definitely had a tendency to keep their human tradition. And we see why. Because they understood that things are there, so they would be always like that, because besides the things and the spirits in the things, there is nothing else. Therefore, when they became a high priest, they are always high priests. They always have the power. They always have everything. No one has the power to change anything. But they are wrong. God changed the history by his power, and Jesus fulfilled the law and opened up the New Testament. That is the human tradition of the Hebrew people. But how about other human traditions? Let's mention one. There's the one very uh, highly praised by, uh, by human history, um, which is called the Buddha. And he was called the, the, almost the wisest man because he really looked into the reality of the misery, miserableness, and the tragedy of a human life in a very deep degree. It is said, I find this on Google, but uh, it said that the Buddha, one, once upon a time, he looked at the world and he found four things passing by. He found a corpse, uh, obviously, taken by someone, a dead body, just uh, taken away. He found that is a tragedy. It's death. It's the end of everything. Um, the youth, the beauty, the wealth, all gone. That's tragedy. And then another old man, very, very weak, very, very old, passing by before him. He thought, oh, this man used to be very strong, like a bodybuilder, like a great um, uh, athlete, but uh, right now, it's like that. And then, again, he find a very sick person in a very extreme sickness. And he find, oh, this person used to be healthy and be able to work and couldn't do anything, enjoy the family, but now, what can he do? And the number four, he found a monk who is meditating. And he thought, oh, this is someone probably understood the life. But what he could do, he could just stay there and meditating and don't do anything. This is what someone really thought through the reality of life and come to these um, observations. It's very, very hard for you and me to come to the same conclusion because we live in the West and we find how easy to get grocery, just go to the supermarket and we get everything. We don't need to farm, we don't need to uh, harvest anything, uh, we, don't need, we don't need to worry about medicine. We just uh, walk by and visit the clinic and we probably got good health so we can enjoy everything. It's hard to see how Buddha see this, but why I take his teaching here? Because he's saying something real. We should not be uh, blurred by what, hap what happening in the Western so-called prosperity. We should see what the world is really going on. When this world is seen in the scope of Buddha, and we really see this world is not an easy place. It has lots of misery. And even we may enjoy some youth, some athletic power, and some intelligence. How many years we can enjoy? The psalm we just said, uh, we're going to have our last day, right? Yeah, there's going to be some day. I can feel I don't have the power when I was 20-ish. I want to be like Schwarzenegger right, right now. I cannot think of that. It's impossible. Just like that, one day, we will lose all of this power. That's simply the fact. Thank you, Mr. Pong. We, we just simply know this. But brothers and sisters, we see what the teaching of Buddha gives us. Buddha says, since our problem is our desire, because we have so many things in the world to look at, to put on, to enjoy in the mall, in the market, in the auto mall, wherever, there are so many things that attract our eyesight, and we're going to experience lots of desires, so we fall into trouble. We want too much. Therefore, how to live a life really, which is really good? There's only one way, which is true wisdom, according to the Buddha, is that limit our desires. How to do that? Get rid of as much as possible. Just confine ourselves within the most minimized amount of clothing, not in the sense of modern 
uh, I'm sorry, women, how they use clothing. It's, it's a different story. But it's really limit their clothing so that they make God sick, but limit their um, consumption of clothing and food and drink uh, in such a way that they will not be uh, distracted by the desires of life. That is his philosophy. What is the end? The end, of course, is that I'm going to reduce my desire. I'm going to have the so-called best life comparing with these huge difference between being so healthy and so bad. And the difference would be a little bit smaller and smaller, so I won't feel too bad. That is so-called true philosophy of the Buddha. But what is the end? Look at how many people they are trying this way. Uh, have they ever really managed their desires? No. They still enjoy meat and drink and wine, and they call that, I enjoy meat, um, but my heart has Buddha, you see. It's the same thing. It won't change the fact that the desire is always in us. We just don't admit it. Even when we try, our, try very hard to suppress that desire, it could explode into a bigger manner. So I shared this tragedy. I have to do it again. So in, in COVID, uh, before COVID, I was very, very thin. I, I probably had the 20, at least the 20 pounds less than I am now because I somehow believed uh, thinner is better. Uh, I'm not saying that's right, but somehow I believe it. And I, I ate a very limited amount of food. And somehow one day, I believed something called one meal a day. So I, I just eat one meal in late night, and I don't eat anything uh, during the day. Maybe just got a cup of coffee. And I, I thought that may uh, make it better. But actually, in my heart, I knew I just want to eat. But I want to eat so much. So I thought uh, three meals, probably too much temptation. I'll just eat one meal, and that may, may be better. But the result is that I'm getting fatter. Because in one meal, I add more than the uh, totality of the three meals. That's simply true. How, and I, I even started eating some of the things like uh, cookies and uh, those sugary things. I've never ate before. That's, okay. I, I don't mean that you're going to fall in the same trap, but uh, that simply happened to me. I just say, managing the desires in such a way like Buddha may not work. Let's come to... Our final point, what is the true teaching? In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 to 8, uh, here is the verse I went to on and on and on, and I could not understand when I was in that trap of uh, gluttony, saying this, but godliness with contentment is a great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. And I said, Lord, what are you talking about? Because in my mind, I thought, yes, I didn't bring anything into this world. Yes, I cannot take away anything from this world. So what do I do? Enjoy this world as much as possible. As long as I don't get diabetes, I will enjoy as much sugary as possible. But I, I, I care other, how other people see me. Maybe I got too fat and they, they're going to point their finger to me. That may make me think a little bit more. But basically, what I'm thinking is, to the limitation of my body or my environment is allowed, I'll enjoy as much as possible as I desired. I find this verse it just cannot get into my heart. It's impossible, especially to the end. With these, we will be content. That's like a promise. And I ask the Lord, how could that be? How could that be? It's just impossible. But as I come back to this verse, we have to say, brothers and sisters, I'm a sinner. You reflect on yourself, probably you're going to feel something similar. This verse is not, tr not naturally true to us. It is a promise of God. And it is based on the gospel. The Lord is not saying that we're going to follow Buddha and to have limited amount of clothing and food and drink and enjoy. No. The fact of the matter is, we shall be content on those things, which is impossible 
for human beings, but nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for God. Nothing. As I was singing the Psalms with you this afternoon, I feel my heart was moved by the Spirit. I feel when we, uh, when we were singing that uh, the Lord is my salvation, and I find this congregation, I, I repent, I pray to the Lord, Lord, I, I, I confess my sin. I didn't put my love to this congregation. This is a great conversa- congregation. Their singing is beautiful. I felt that kind of grace from the Lord, from the singing of you. This true happened to my heart. So I was moved. I could not sing the last verse. This is something from heaven, not from earth. It is impossible to find this contentment simply by focusing on those materials, no matter though are the religious religious rituals to keep or those so-called sacred elements on their own, trying to think that there are some goodness in their own. No, it is the Spirit of God working powerfully through His Word, in his church. That is the privilege of God's children, God's elect in this world. It is by this privilege from heaven that we may truly contend that we don't have much. We don't have very much people. We don't have very great facilities like those so-called big churches who pursue the human wills and desires and use those bands and this and that to pursue desire to give more. No, we don't have much of that. But what we have is from the Lord. It is the heavenly desire. It's from his word. Is that the truth is preached, is heard in our heart. And we feel, Lord, you are my only salvation and you are my only desire. That is what Paul commanded his follower, Timothy, to remind, to remember. It is also what we receive from the Lord as Timothys to remember, not by our own power, but by the promise of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We may be content by the Lord, what he provided for us and what he reserved for us as a congregation, no matter in life, no matter in work, no matter in family, what do we pursue? It's not to mastering the things of this world with doom to pass by, but what we are aiming at is the heavenly word of God, which never pass by. Even this world will pass by, but my word will not pass away. That is the promise of the Lord, and that's the privilege of his children, you and me. Do you enjoy God's word and his church and his ways like this? If you are not, I'm the same as you. It's a heart. It's not from us. It's from the Lord. But he listened to our prayer, right? What do you recite? Beautiful. He will, for the sake of what? Jesus Christ, listen to our prayer. True, this is a heavenly king. He will give us, pray to him, no matter where, publicly, in school, anywhere, ask the Lord, enjoy that. He will give wisdom, the true wisdom, not the parented wisdom, but the true wisdom from heaven to you. No matter what, what position you are in workplace or what position you are in university or what position you are in family, whatever, ask the Lord. He will remind you his word. He guide you what to do, where to go, and enjoy that joy unspeakable, only reserved for his children. Have you ever experienced that? Ask the Lord. If you have never experienced something like this, let me remind you, do not be deceived by Satan. Satan just wanted you to think that a religion is just a human phenomena, and you just do it, And that's it. It's like a duty. It's like manipulating people. It's like something can be used by politicians to get some votes. Not like that. Truth is truth. It's not determined by human beings. It's by heaven. Do not think in that way. Truly trust the Lord. Do not trust that Bible is just a special book, but it is the true word of the heavenly Lord, the triune God. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know what? When you feel that you want to trust Him, it's not by your power. 
is by the Spirit of God, who only moves the child of God. Let's give thanks to the Lord together. Our Father in heaven, we come before you with praise and thanksgiving. We praise you as our Father, who not only created this world with ultimate wisdom only reserved in your mind, but you also give us your scripture, the Bible, so that we may receive what we should receive, the true wisdom from you by your revelation that we may receive by the power of your spirit as your children. So Father, help us. Help us to enjoy your word and the life in your church more than anything else, that your name shall be glorified and our joy will be more than anything we can enjoy in this world. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brother Skyler, for that message. A response that is stand and sing. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Your grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley, He will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, yet not I but through Christ in me. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released, I can sing. I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. 
When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Please be seated. Now is the time for offering. Offering is the right and the responsibility for all Christians. So if you have not yet believed or... Um, yeah, if you've not yet believed, please help us by passing the offering bag. And as the ushers come up, let us sing, This is my Father's World. This is my Father's World. And to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, I rest me in the and trees of skies and seas his hand the wonders wrought this is my father's world the birds their carols raise the morning light the lily white declare their maker praise. This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. Please stand. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget That though the wrong seems all so strong God is the ruler yet This is my Father's world Why should my heart be sad? is king, let the heavens ring, rains, let earth be glad. <clears throat> Let's pray for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving, giving us this, this world for us to steward, and thank you for, for all that you've given us in, in our lives whether we, we notice it or we don't. Thank you for all, all of your blessings. Thank you for your mercy and your goodness to us, um, even though we do not deserve such graciousness. And we just ask that you would move our hearts so that we would give, um, give willingly to you. And I just ask that this, this offering would be used for the furthering of your kingdom and for the, the building of your church and uh, just the furthering of your ministry. In Jesus, Jesus Christ may pray. Amen. Amen. Let us sing doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Please be seated and have a moment of silent prayer. Okay, folks. Okay, once again, welcome to join our Sunday service. May our Lord lead us, guide us, and protest us in this coming week. May share His gospel to all your labor's friends. And yes, okay. Thank